So um, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe and like the video for access to more briefings with top tier journalists. Um, if you are joining us on Facebook or if you're joining us on Twitter or if you're joining us on LinkedIn Live, uh, we're actually doing this live on Zoom right now. And if you want to attend live and ask questions, just go to ericschwartzman.com forward slash earned media. And that'll get you a link so you can get into the Zoom uh, as we're going now. Um, today we have with us David Pogue. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. Now, after graduating summa cum laude from Yale in 85, with a distinction in music, David spent 10 years conducting and arranging Broadway musicals in New York. I'd love to just talk about that, but I don't want to use up the time. Um, he was also a New York Times weekly tech columnist from 2000 to 2013. He's a five-time Emmy winner for his stories on CBS News Sunday Morning. He's also a New York Times bestselling author, a five-time TED speaker, and host of 20 Nova Science specials on PBS. David, welcome to the Earn Media Podcast. Thank you so much, but I'm afraid that's all the time we have. <laughs> we'll see you later. It's that bio's got to got to come down a bit. Uh, actually, I, I I thought that was pretty skinny because there are <laughs> other. I mean, I think you've published 120 books. I have. That's a big number. Well, you know, most of those are computer books, and I'm counting the next year's revision as a new title because it has a new title. So it's it's probably inflated, but it does impress people at parties. Now, 97% of scientists agree that the planet is getting warmer because of fossil fuel emissions. Now, to understand how that's happening, think about the temperature inside your car with the windows rolled up in a, hard, in a hot parking lot. If the windows are rolled up, it's going to get a lot hotter inside the car than it is in the parking lot. If you roll the windows down, the heat escapes, and it's the same temperature inside the car as it is in the parking lot. It's against the law to leave a dog in a parked car because they can die from the heat. Unfortunately, we don't afford the human species the same protections because the fossil fuel industry is literally rolling up the windows around our planet and we haven't made it illegal. Now, the reason the earth is getting hotter is because emissions get caught in our atmosphere. Uh, the Earth is really just one car in a parking lot of planets we call the universe. And uh, by burning fossil fuels, we're rolling up the windows around our planet. The scientific consensus is that global warming is happening because of this greenhouse effect. Uh, but despite the existential threat uh, climate change poses, there are 150 members of Congress, all Republicans, who say they do not believe in climate change. If that's puzzling to you and you'd like to understand why that's the case and what you can do about it, download my new report, How to Wind Support for Climate Action at ericschwartzman.com forward slash climate action. Now, now, David, you're certainly not disputing global warming. Your latest book, How to Prepare for Climate Change is a practical and comprehensive guide to surviving the greatest disaster of our time. Uh, now, first off, I thought you were a tech guy. What are you doing writing about climate? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, you know, I've been actually been quietly uh, getting more and more interested in the environment and climate. In my other job, in particular, for CBS Sunday Morning as a reporter, I've been doing an increasing number of stories over the last 10 years, I'd say, on uh, I've done fracking, I've done the plastics problem, I've done global warming twice. Um, so... But but to be clear, I was not an expert on any of the topics in this book on, you know, where to live and what to grow and how to insure and where to invest before I started the book. Um, I spent two years interviewing experts and, you know, reading till my eyes fell out. I mean, insurance, <laughs> my wife says that I could I could spend two hours at a cocktail party just talking about flood insurance. I'd be a real gas. Um, so I, I sort of did a reporting job with this book. It's not me, the expert, it's, it's sort of me, the reporter. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a slow evolution and you know, science and tech aren't unrelated. Clearly. Now, if for someone like me, right, or anyone might, might be listening to this who's not a scientist, 
what do we have to go on other than, you know, the, the, the scientific consensus that climate change is real? So it's interesting, your introduction was really interesting. One of the things that I, that I learned also in researching the book, when we say that there are people who don't accept climate change, there are really two things we might mean. We might mean there are people who don't believe that the climate is changing, that there's nothing different about the weather this year from 20 years ago. Then there's another group that says, yes, of course the climate is changing, but the climate always changes and it always has. The, 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 what we debate is whether or not we and our emissions are responsible for it or whether it's just a completely natural cycle. So the first group of people is really, I mean, is there anyone who can look out their window or look at the news and not say the climate is changing? I mean, look at the wildfires in California, you know, Oregon and Washington, um, or the hurricanes that are, you know, these hundred year hurricanes that are now happening every five years or, um, you know, the, the hottest day ever reliably recorded on the planet Earth was this year in Death Valley, the United States, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, the graphs of the sea level temperature and the graphs of the air temperature are just steadily, steadily going up and have been since 1880 when records began and when we started burning fossil fuels. Um, so I think that the group of people who disputes that, that there's anything going on is almost zero at this point. There is still a, a big chunk of people who say, yeah, things are changing, but we're not responsible. You know, the beauty for my purposes <laughs> for selling a book about how to prepare, it doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter if you think it's natural or man-made. Uh, you still need to get ready. It's still time to start thinking about how you're going to get set for, for this new era. In 2005, I was doing some consulting for the U.S. Department of State. And at the time, the word global warming as a search phrase had the volume and climate change was really a contender. Uh, <laughs> but if you look at it now, um, climate change is the, may, is the phrase and, and global warming has, has dropped as a popular phrase. You think about the type of government bureaucraties language that's used I guess almost in an Orwellian doublespeak fashion to make a threat seem less threatening. Certainly climate change is one of them. Um, it's a little bit more esoteric, more innocuous. Why did you decide to go with climate change instead of global warming for the title? I think, I think global warming is a really poor term in general. Um, it, it implies that what we're worried about is the world getting warmer. And yeah, it is, but that's just, the first domino that trigger, I mean, climate change, as you've seen in the world around you means hotter, uh, it means longer, hotter droughts and more devastating, longer rainstorms. It means freakish temperatures in the summer and freakish temperatures in the winter. I mean, there was one day last year when it snowed in Honolulu. I mean, just crazy stuff. It means um, all these ripple effects, smaller goats, higher chocolate prices, higher rates of bar fights and car thefts. I mean, each of these has a logical, I could explain how it's related to the change in climate, but the point is it's, it's just really climate chaos is the right term or global weirding. I've heard that one. I like global weirding, but I mean, you, you turn up the thermostat and all, you know, it, it affects the animal migrations. It, in, it affects the insect migrations. We're now getting thousands and thousands more cases of Lyme disease on the East Coast because the ticks are going much farther north because the deer they ride on, right? The, the, the winters are getting milder on the East Coast. So they are feeling free to move farther north. Same thing with mosquitoes. Mosquitoes used to be a tropical problem, dengue fever and malaria. And now mosquitoes are like, well, hey, the whole United States is mine for the taking because I don't get killed off in the winter anymore because it doesn't get cold. So we're seeing increasing uh, instances of dengue fever and West Nile virus. And all this chaos is just coming from the sort of warming of the earth. So it's a great question. There's a, there's a big discussion of what the term we should use in the book, uh, but global warming is not it. That, that makes people think it's about, oh, poor you, you have to turn up the AC a little bit in the summer. It's, it, the warming is only the first step. You know, the warming makes, I mean, <laughs> how, how many hours you got? Uh, I, could, I could just go on, but the, 
you've heard of the sea level rising, and that's because water expands as it gets warmer, right? If you've ever melted a melted ice in the freezer and then watched it thaw and break the container. Um, but it also means that as the huge white ice patches of the earth, you know, Greenland and stuff, as they melt and the, and the water, uh, the ice in the water as well, it's normally white, which reflects sunlight, which keeps us cooler. But as the, all that land and sea ice melts, we're replacing white patches, thousands and thousands of square miles with dark patches of ocean and ground. And of course, as you know, from wearing a dark, piece of clothing in the summer, dark colors absorb heat. So we're replacing white reflective areas with dark heat absorptive areas, and that makes the ocean heat up even more. So anyways, just a few examples to show you how it's just this massive chain. So are, are we past the point of no return at this? I mean, is, it, is climate chaos inevitable at this point, or could we avert it? Um, I mean, it's, it's obviously already happened, you know, the wildfires, the hurricanes, the droughts, the bug infestations, uh, the climate has changed and will continue to change. 93% of the absorbed heat, and by the way, your, your explanation of the dog in the parked car, spot on. I mean, green, greenhouse effect is a poor term, I think, because how many people have ever been in a greenhouse? Not very many, but dog in the parked car effect, that's it. But 93% of that heat is in the oceans and the water takes a long time to heat up or cool down. So we're talking about, I mean, if we stopped burning fossil fuels today, we're talking about you know, 80 years, 150 years before the oceans cool down to their previous temperature. So you and I won't see any stopping to climate change. Our children, our grandchildren will not see a return to like 1980s levels. Um, after that it's possible. Uh, there was this advisor to Barack Obama named John Holdren who said this famous quote, we have three ways of approaching climate change. There is mitigation, which means trying to stop it, you know, eat less red meat, fly less, have fewer children. Uh, and then there's adaptation, which means trying to adapt to this new world. That's, that's what my book is about. And then the, the third option is suffering. And so the amount of the first two we do depends on how much of the suffering we're going to have. So at, at this point, almost everything I've ever read, almost all the books published is all about mitigation. It's all about how to stop climate change. And we should, we absolutely should. We need to decarbonize. We need to move to electric cars. We need to stop, you know, find a way to fly without burning petroleum. Um, on and on and on, everybody's heard these techniques, but there's very, been very little written about adaptation, about what you can do. So anyway, to answer your question is no, we, we can't stop it on a dime. The, 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 the forces have been launched and they will be continuing to affect us for decades. Um, I, I interviewed the, the guy who runs CAL FIRE, the California Department of Forestry and Wildfires. And I said, so you guys have just had three consecutive record-breaking years of wildfires in California. Um, so this is the new normal for you, huh? And he said, no, you don't get it. That's not how we talk about it internally. We don't see this as the new end stage. We see this as the beginning. This is just the beginning of the wildfire era. And this is, we're gonna look back at this year and laugh at how, what a baby step it was. You know, this uh, um, topic of adaptability is fascinating. Uh, the New York Times, I don't know, two, three months ago, maybe more, ran in the Sunday magazine uh, a cover story on the great climate migration. And I'm yeah. sure you saw it. And they talked about, you know, how the greatest fortunes would be made by landowners who transferred wealth from, you know, the lower states uh, up to the area around the Great Lakes. So, um, so talk to us about, you know, where will be the safest places to live and how soon do we need to move? Yeah, that's, that's one of the most, most asked questions about what's in this book is, is where to live. Not everybody obviously has the opportunity to move, but 40 million Americans a year do. Maybe you're graduating, maybe you're getting out of the military, maybe you're retiring. People do move electively. So the basic idea is this. The East Coast is a problem because of rising sea levels and hurricanes and storms 
um, and the bugs and their diseases. Um, so East Coast is a big place. It's from Florida to New England. Are you referring to the entire East Coast? Well, 40% of the United States lives in coastal communities, believe it or not. Like if you looked at a map of our population, you'd see we're predominantly settled on the coasts of the country. The middle of the country is empty by comparison. What do you consider coastal? How many miles? Um, you mean how many miles from the water? Yeah. Um, 40 miles coastal or I'm, I'm counting miles? I'm counting counties that actually have a shoreline. So okay. County. Along, along the United States, 40% of us live in those areas. So which on the includes East LA Coast, County, which is obviously huge, but not everyone's close right. to the water. That's right. That's right. And that will that will play a part in, in my recommendations, as you'll see in just a second. I mean, some of the great places to live are coastal states, but inland, like not not shorefront. Um, but but the general regions of the country, there are even the even the government, even under the Trump administration, they have analyzed the parts of the country that will be affected worse by climate change. And they, they do it by these regions. So the Northeast, you've got the problems of superstorms, and that isn't just on the beach, that's also inland. You've got the problems of the mosquitoes and the ticks, which are bringing a whole world of new disease to places that have never had it. Um, and you've got the extreme heat. Um, in the South, well, Florida, you know, North Carolina goes without saying, you've got hurricanes and flooding and sea level rise. The entire South is going to get in some places uninhabitably hot by the middle of the century. Like if you're an outdoor worker, I mean, you, you sh you'll be advised not to stay out more than an hour with, without coming into shade and drinking. It'll just get so brutally hot. The West Coast has sea level rise and these crazy insane wildfires and drought. I mean, California is basically in its ninth year of a historic drought. They haven't had anything like this since 1840. Um, there are you know, rules about, in, at the peak of this thing, there are rules about when you can wash your car and when you can water your lawn and stuff like that. So that's a problem for the West Coast. So the bottom line is the sweet spot for where to live, there's two of them. One is the Pacific Northwest. The Pacific Northwest, oh, and I, for, I forgot to mention the one that everybody forgets, fresh water. You need fresh water to drink. And a huge percentage of us in this country get our water from either snow melt, like the entire Western half of the United States gets their fresh water from melting snowpack up in the mountains and the glaciers that melts. Well, guess what? The winters are shorter now. You don't get as much snow building up up there. So there's less water flowing it starts flowing later and dries up sooner. So that's a real problem for our sources of fresh water. And the rest of us get our water from aquifers, which are these huge underground deposits of, of water. And there is not a single aquifer in the United States that isn't drying up, like at an alarming rate. Um, you know, the Hoover Dam, the, the lake that it created is called Lake Mead. And it is where 25 million people in Nevada and California get their fresh water from. The Lake Mead is now two thirds empty. So that, that thing is drying up and running out of water. So that's the other thing to think about when you're deciding where to move is where are we gonna get our fresh water? So Pacific Northwest, rainy, lots of glaciers, lots of snow melt, good for fresh water. The climate is temperate. It's not going to be too hot. They do have wildfires and they do have this massive infestation of pine beetles. <laughs> if, if you're not depressed enough about climate change, look up the pine beetles. They're, they're, they're killing 100,000 trees a day. I mean, we're talking about helicopter flyovers showing miles upon miles of what used to be beautiful pine forests flattened, just gone. Because again, there's no more winter to kill off their babies. So they're just expanding like crazy. But in general, the Pacific Northwest has a great economy. You also have to think about like, not just the weather where you're moving, but also how is it as a place to live? So Pacific Northwest, fantastic economy, interesting people, um, well-educated. They've got fantastic mitigation systems in place for, for climate stuff. The even better one though, as you said, is the Great Lakes area. The Rust Belt is about to have its day, you know, Cleveland, Buffalo, 
Um, Madison, Wisconsin keeps coming up as the perfect climate haven um, because it's built around five lakes. So eternal fresh water. I mean, the great, any, any of these great lake cities will have fresh water forever. No wildfires, no insect pests, no hurricanes. I mean, they are the ideal climate havens and they also have plenty of room to grow. I mean, these, these cities, Buffalo, Syracuse, these are towns that you know, used to be in industrial uh, capitals um, that have plenty of room to grow, room to renovate, and the cost of living is crazy cheap. One dollar in New York City, in Cleveland, buys you two dollars and seventy-one cents worth of stuff. I mean, think of the house you can get in Cleveland. I'm from Cleveland, so you know, I have a small bias. But anyway, uh, yeah. So, so really, the Midwest, the, the Rust Belt states, those cities are really the sweet spots for climate change. How soon do, I mean, do, do, do we need to move this year? How long do we have? When do you think it start, starts getting competitive there, you know, for real estate? Do you have any sort of timeline? Yeah, I mean, the, the climate changes that we're seeing are just beginning and they're going to be getting worse as we get toward 2100 and beyond. I mean, the, the climate crisis doesn't, pay attention to our human way of numbering years, right? It's a, it's a spectrum. It's an ongoing sled into badness. So, but what I will tell you is that already real estate in Miami that's on the water is down 7% from the identical homes that are inland and higher up. In other words, their risk of flooding is already affecting their resale value. So anyone who's thinking or anyone whose parents are thinking of retiring to Florida starts needing to think about, well, shoot, is that a good idea, both from a weather standpoint, a hurricane standpoint, and from a financial standpoint? I mean, I think you'd be crazy to buy real estate in Florida right now. Sorry. Um, so, so the answer is there, there's, no, there's no set time. I can't say move by 2050 because your tolerance for what's happening around you is, is, is gradually changing. And you have limited numbers of opportunities in your life when you can move, right? If you have a job and a family and a social network, you're not gonna just move for climate reasons, probably, unless you live in Florida. Um, but you, you may have a, a window, you know, when your last kid goes to college, when you retire, when you wanna quit your job and start fresh, those are times when you might think about, well now, where should we move? My, my wife and I, uh, our, our last child goes to college in two years. So there's nothing pinning us to where we are anymore. So we're already doing this kind of math. Where do you like? <laughs> I have never been to Madison, Wisconsin, but this, <laughs> this I've been town- there. I have been there. I mean, when my research, that town has won more best quality of life awards from magazines that any city I've ever seen. It's terrific best cheddar cheese. I mean, <laughs> that's where hook, hook, you know, the 15 year hook cheddar comes from Madison. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Madison, Wisconsin, first of all, it's beautiful. Second of all, highly educated populace, you know, college town. Um, they have this zoning rule that no building can ever be taller than their beautiful Capitol building. So they will never become a, a metropolis, a, a concrete jungle. But you know, Burlington, Vermont looks really sweet. New Hampshire looks incredible. You know, we just took a uh, trip, my wife and I, we drove through New Hampshire as the leaves changed. We never saw the leaves change before. Oh, and great. it is the most delightful. And we went to Vermont as well. It was gorgeous. We just, we thought, wow, this is fantastic. But I mean, I'm from LA, man. I can't handle the cold. You know, <laughs> I need to walk my dog and play tennis year round. So I don't know. Well, the cold, the cold will be getting better. All, you might notice that all these Midwestern cities I've been describing are places, uh, including Chicago, by the way, another great climate change city, if you like a bigger place. They all have uh, really cold winters right now, but those winters are already seven degrees warmer than they were in 1970. And they're, get, they're getting warmer every year. So the idea is think ahead now to where we're gonna be in 30 years. So I know in the book you talk about um, you know building codes and you know uh, you know I guess it's a, a three little pigs thing right you don't you, you don't want anybody to huff and puff and blow your house down so how will climate change impact 
the way we look at real estate and the way we buy structures and build structures? Yeah, that's a great question. The next time you build a house or are looking to buy a house or are renovating, it's worth thinking ahead about how the climate is going to change things. Um, one of the really painful things about climate change is that it disproportionately affects poor neighborhoods and communities of color every time. They're the ones who get slammed worse by the hurricanes. They're the ones whose houses burn worse. They're the ones whose houses blow down in tornadoes because they're inexpensively built. So uh, I'm, I would try really hard not to make this book some elitist thing about if you have the money, you can do this. And there are certain things, steps that you can take that cost no money that you can think ahead now. And the two key things, what all climate disasters have in common is loss of water and loss of power. So you get loss of water in, um, when, when in a heavy rain or a hurricane. This is, <laughs> this is something I've learned that really grossed me out. 700 American cities have a sewage system that is also supposed to handle rain runoff. It's the same set of pipes under the city, okay? So in Chicago, for example, that, that's, and then, oh, and, then, and then all that effluent, all that uh, sewage and rainwater runs into water treatment plants. In Chicago, they're right at the lake. Um, they process the sewage and then dump the clean water into the lake. Well, guess what? Nowadays, 50 times a year, Chicago's rains are so heavy that the water treatment plant plants are overwhelmed. So they have no choice but to dump the raw sewage into the lake. And you hear people talk about turning on their faucets in their bathroom and sewage comes out like in their homes. So it's an increasing problem. So the point is in times of extreme weather, uh, the, 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 the city's uh, water system can get overloaded. So you need to think about where you're gonna get water. And one thing I learned is that you have a lot of fresh water already in the walls of your house. And when you worry that the city's water might be contaminated, you can think ahead. So here are those sources. Um, the toilet, and I, I don't mean the bowl, unless you're a Labrador. Uh, the, no, the tank has three gallons of fresh, clean water, not yet flushed. Um, there, there's water in the pipes of your house. If you have a two-story, three-story house, you can open up uh, the, the, the faucets on the top floor and fresh clean water already in the walls of your house will pour out the bottom ones. Your hot water heater in the basement, you got 80 gallons of fresh clean water already in your house. So what you do is you shut off the water from the city at the top and no more contamination can come into your house. So there's some simple things. And of course, you've heard the old thing about fill up your bathtub when a hurricane is coming or a super storm. That's, that's usable. Most people would consider that a use as gray water, not water not for drinking or cooking, but you know, doing a sponge bath or watering your plants or you know, doing the laundry or something like that. So um, you have a lot of great sources of gray water around the house too. Um, the, the second thing, oh, and then, and then a lot of people these days, especially in storm prone areas are setting aside giant water tanks, like these plastic barrels, go to Home Depot, get one of these things for 40 bucks. And uh, the FDA says that the water in those, as long as you fill them in a sanitary way, wash your hands, so on, um, you can keep that thing sealed up and safe in your basement or you know, backyard for five years, the water will keep fresh. And bottled water from the stores, I'm not a big fan of the plastic waste, but, it, but that water unopened will keep fresh indefinitely. It doesn't spoil or go rotten or anything like that. So a lot of people may take the simple step of having water to drink using one of those methods. And then the other big issue is power. Every, all of these things, windstorms, wildfires, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, all of them interrupt power. So there's a scale of generators that you can get. And as you can imagine, sales of generators are up something like 1400% from five years ago. Um, there are whole house generators that cost you know, $10,000 and up that are permanently installed and kick in to power your whole house or just the important parts of your house if you wanna save money. And then there are the gasoline powered ones that, that start up with a, like a lawnmower um, those are in the $400, $500 range, and those can keep your refrigerator going, let you charge your phones and keep a couple of lights on. 
And then for $15 from you know, Amazon or whatever, you can get a little hand cranked unit that contains a, a charger for your phone, um, a, a flashlight and an FAA emergency radio. Um, doesn't use any fuel at all. You just hand crank it. And it's something, you know, can keep your, your phone going when the chips are down. So there's a whole range of these things. But the point is, the point is to prepare to think of this now, because guess what? When the big hurricane is coming, you won't be able to buy them. These things sell out. You'll find empty shelves. You won't be able to buy bottled water at the store. It'll be sold out. We all know that by now. So do the preparation now and know that you're ready. Yeah. My uh, father-in-law sells solar panels to people's homes. And uh, now he's got a lot of customers that are buying these Tesla batteries and installing them in their garages so that they can charge them up and have power. I guess if there's, because sometimes when it gets hot, they'll shut off the power if you're in a rural area because they don't want sparks to start a fire. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, agriculture. I know a couple of weeks ago, I think in the New York Times, the cover story of the magazine was the, uh, speculation that Russia actually standed to gain quite a lot because they could become the next breadbasket, the next agricultural uh, center because their land would be, they would have a longer growing season as a result of climate change. Um, what should we expect with respect to agricultural and what can we do to prepare for that? Yeah, that's, that's a really amazing point. I, if, if, if any of your listeners have not been tracking climate change, the, the, cha the rapidity, the speed of how things are changing, one of my experts has calculated that the heat zone, the, the, the band around the middle of the earth, the equator, that is spreading northward and southward from the equator, the expanding warmth is expanding five and a half feet a day. And every time you think about that, imagine the critters that live in those areas, the mosquitoes, the ticks, and so on. That's how much their territory is expanding a day. And that's how much the agricultural regions are becoming too hot and dry to grow per day. So absolutely, the, the growing areas are going to shift. They are shifting. Um, in the United States, <coughs> we're frantically trying to cultivate new, uh, excuse me, uh, we're trying to cultivate new breeds of seeds. You know, Monsanto, example, for example, is trying to develop uh, corn that will grow in hotter, drier conditions. Um, you know, again, with this idea of how people tend to simplify climate change, um, people imagine, well, that must mean that the, the growing areas of the United States are, are drying up. It's getting hotter and they're having drought. Well, they are, but what happens is you get these droughts that are worse than they've ever been, literally since the Dust Bowl. And then you get this massive rain, worst rain they've ever seen. Last year, 20% uh, of all the growing counties in Nebraska were flooded fields. You, we couldn't get anything out of them. And that's because once the drought has happened, the ground is dried out and cracked and doesn't absorb water. So when the rain comes, it doesn't soak down into the earth like it should. It just sits on top and flood stuff and your plants drown. So anyway, so yeah, so the agricultural areas are, sh are shifting north uh, in the Northern hemisphere. So what this means is that we're going to have to not only develop the new seeds and the new growing methods, but we're going to shift more toward Canada for where the farms are. And as you, as you say, in Russia, they're, they're like <laughs> hot diggity. <laughs> this is great for us because we're talking about Greenland as a new phenomenal growth belt for agriculture. Um, and if you think that's absurd, do keep in mind that Siberia, Siberia, the cold tundra, desolate lands of Russia reached a hundred degrees this summer. Wow. A hundred degrees wow. Fahrenheit in Siberia and had the worst wildfires in recorded history in Siberia. Wow. I was in Siberia in the late 90s Whoa. doing um, humanitarian aid with the organization called Wheels for Peace. We took over a cargo container full of wheelchairs and distributed them to kids all over the place. And the year I was there was the first year that they had an election there. 
Wow. Yeah, it was really very interesting. And it was freaking freezing. And my job was to make the video. So when I took the video camera from the, all the heat was radiator heat. So I'd have it inside to be working fine. And then I'd take it outside and the whole lens would fog up and I couldn't shoot for an hour. So it's almost like I had to have two cameras, one inside, one outside. Yeah. And then you have the, the effect of the cold on your battery, no doubt. Like it, yep. it really kills the- And your face. Battery. It yeah. really, it has an effect on your face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's talk about investments. How is, how, now that you've read, read uh, written this book, how has your investment strategy changed? Oh man, this is a great one. So the, the bottom line is, as it was explained to me by all of these uh, fund managers, we are going to decarbonize, okay? The planet is going to move away from burning fuel uh, that come from, from the ground. So th this is already well underway. And in the next 50, 80 years, it's going to see each other to completion. This is going to involve a transfer of trillions of dollars changing hands between companies and investors and, um, and consumers and cor corporations. So anyone who can position themselves in this stream of money is going to do really well. So the question is, okay, so where do I invest if I have money to invest? Your first thought might be, okay, well, decarbonizing, that means solar power and wind power. Um, I don't know if you've seen the numbers, but solar power and wind power are going crazy 70% of all new power generation to be built next year will be solar or wind power the number of new coal plants planned in the united states zero in fact coal plants are being taken offline uh, one of my experts said by 2030 um, there won't be another coal plant running in the united states coal is just going away and part of it's solar and wind but part of it's because how inexpensive Fracking has made natural gas too. That's last year for the first time, renewable power, uh, wind and solar actually exceeded coal use in this country. The graphs are literally crossing each other. And that's partly because, primarily because solar power is so cheap. It has fallen way faster in price than anybody ever anticipated. Wind power too. But that's also the reason it's not a good investment. You don't want to buy into something whose value is plummeting, right? The Chinese are building these solar panels and just flooding the market with them, dumping them on the, on the market. It's a race to the bottom. It's a commodity. So what my experts were telling me, oh, and the same thing with electric cars. There's, there's not a car company left, including General Motors and Ford, who haven't announced that they are transitioning to electric cars, right? So your first thought will be, oh, well, I'll invest in Tesla. I'll invest in Nissan, you know, with their Leaf. Um, but the smarter investor thinks upstream. What components do all the car companies need to buy in common? And the number one answer is batteries. All of the, all, every single car battery company is Asian. There are, there's no such thing as a European or American battery maker. Even Tesla, they have that gigafactory in, La, in Nevada. Um, that is the, the battery manufacturer side of that is run by Panasonic. And then they hand the finished cells to the other side of the building for Tesla to incorporate. So think of the four giant Asian companies, uh, LG Chem and, um, and Samsung has a, a battery division. Um, think of the connectors and the wiring that they're all going to need. Think of copper mines because all these cars use so much wiring and this one I never, never occurred to me until this guy told me, think about the lithium mines because they all use lithium ion batteries. There is going to be such an increase in the value of lithium. So why not get in on that now? Um, there, are, there are two giant ones. One's American called Albemarle and one is Chilean. Um, and they run the biggest lithium mines in the world. And they're upstream from every electric car. Um, Another thing to think about is we talked about agriculture. So as these farms move northward, that means new people in new areas buying new farm equipment. John Deere, Navistar. I mean, they're going to be, as well as the seed companies that are developing new breeds, Monsanto and so on. So you gotta, you gotta think about what are the massive mega effects and who's going to profit from those. 
And the last thing I'd say on investment is uh, virtually every expert on climate change agrees that sooner or later, we're going to need a carbon tax, a carbon pricing scheme to put on, on fuel, fossil fuels as they come out of the ground or as they're consumed or as they're spewed into the, into the air. And every major corporation has a duplicate set of spreadsheets where they plan their growth, their profit and loss based on what happens if we get a carbon tax. So think about the companies that would lose if a carbon tax is passed. Airlines, cruise lines, autom uh, automotive, automotive and petroleum companies, they would be slammed if, if a carbon tax comes to pass. Their bottom line would suffer terribly. Who would do well? Well, utility companies like NextEra and Xcel Energy that have heavily invested in renewable energy. Um, what you don't realize is that many states now have mandates that they have to get a certain percentage of their power from renewable sources already. New York, California, and Hawaii, it's 50% already. So these utility companies know they have a built-in customer in these states. So they're investing in giant wind farms and solar farms, and they're going to be the ones sitting pretty when the carbon tax comes to pass. Uh, I wanna talk about how we should be discussing these issues with our children. But first, uh, TalkWalker just released the 2021 Social Media Trends Report, which dives deep into social media marketing strategies that will be most effective in 2021 based on interviews with influencers and research from their own media monitoring intelligence platform. Uh, it is an amazing report that you don't want to miss, and you can download it at ericschwartzman.com forward slash TalkWalker. So, so David, um, how, how do we talk to our kids about this stuff? Um, yeah, I, I wrote a whole chapter on, on what to, how to handle climate change in your kids. Um, and the one takeaway, I talked to a number of child psychologists who've studied this, is that don't try to hide the problem from your kids. They already know. They did a survey of second graders and 85% of them were worried about the end of the world in their lifetimes. I mean, young, young kids are really worried. So you speak frankly to them about the problem. You, you explain, you know, it's, it's an age, uh, age dependent speech that you're making, but you explain how the clim climate change problem comes about. And then you explain that the world's greatest minds are working on the problem. And you give some examples. You tell them how solar and wind power are going through the roof. And you stress that no matter what happens, we'll be here with you. We will protect you. Um, but you don't minimize the problem because they will see through you. They will hear about it from somewhere outside the house and not trust you because you've given them a different picture. So it's a, it was really a shocking bit of news that all of these psychologists told me. Uh, because I think I would be in the category of trying to shield my kids from hearing the bad news. But it turns out that's not the right approach. What about mixed messages? Because, uh, you know, you said maybe, you know, there may be some debate about whether or not climate change is anthropogenic, but everyone knows that it's happening. But what about those people who may be in those communities where they're hearing one thing from their parents about the dangers of climate change, and then maybe in their school or in their community, uh, hearing from people that are telling them something else. How, how do they deal with that? How do you deal with that? Yeah, you know, the, the advice for dealing with deniers is the same, whether you're an adult or a child. And that is, and this is also really hard for me to accept because I'm such a science guy, fact guy. The rule is you can't change somebody's mind with facts of an opinion that didn't come from facts. So you cannot browbeat a climate denier into changing his or her mind with statistics or facts or science. In fact, you run the risk of pushing them the other way because their concerns are not based on facts and figures. Their concerns are far more deep seated. Um, it's, I mean, one huge problem with, with the, the way Americans are having trouble accepting climate change or our responsibility for it is that the American way 
is based on consumption. It's it, you're, you're rated, your self-worth, your societal worth is based on how much you've achieved, how much you've amassed, how rich you are. And that means consumption. And that means cars and houses and planes, um, plane flights. So it, it, it's, it's, it's sort, of, sort of saying we have to change everything we know about ourselves. And that's really hard for people to do. I mean, people's fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers worked in the mines and the oil fields and the manufacturing plants all to bring us this bigger life of consumption. And we're saying, you know, no dude, that's, that's been wrong all along. That's, that's really hard to take. And also fear is a thing. The unknown is the scariest thing there is. And so when we're saying the world is changing, the patterns that have governed nature for thousands of years are changing, it's absolutely terrifying. You have to have some compassion. So when you talk to a denier, do more listening than talking. One therapist told me, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And I think that's a fantastic policy. Do more listening than talking. And above all, if you have to discuss your concerns about climate change, do it in personal terms. Oh, I have this uncle and his farm flooded completely last year, or my kids are so worried. They see the wildfires on the news. Make it personal. Don't use facts and figures and try to keep the conversation going. You know, the truth is in this country, it is not politically unsafe to be a denier and hold elected office. Um, you know, we have senators like James Inhofe, the Republican from Oklahoma, who's received almost two million in political donations from uh, coal and oil, um, and who was the guy who held the snowball uh, in the in the House as an or in the in the Senate as an example of the Earth not getting warmer. Um, what is there anything we can do? to make climate denial unsafe, politically unsafe as a position for people like that? Because obviously, you know, the damage of that is not just domestic. Those stories have legs internationally. And then when we get to the table to negotiate with climate ministers on policy and caps, you know, they're looking at that and saying, why should we take you guys seriously when you guys are deniers? I mean, they paint us with one breath, brush, just like the media paints all Muslims with a terrorist brush, you know? So what do we do about that? Is there any, you have any ideas for how we might attack that problem? Yes. Uh, it turns out that uh, it is already politically unsafe to do nothing about climate change. It is already, um, th there's this great outfit called the Yale Center for Climate Communications. And all they do is take the temperature of the American populace on their feelings about climate change. Um, as of their latest survey, the number of Americans who deny that we are responsible for the change in climate is down to 37%. So that's a third of us. And to me, that's still shocking. I mean, you, the, the amount of scientific evidence that has mounted that this is what's happening, it to me is incontrovertible. incontrovertible, incontrovertible. But uh, I was taking, talking to David Wallace Wells. He's the author of a book called The Uninhabitable Earth, big bestseller about the future if we do nothing. And he was thrilled by that. He's like, only 37%? First of all, that's a much lower number than even a year ago. And second of all, he reminded me that 25% of Americans believe that aliens walk among us. So anytime you can get over 50% of Americans believing anything in common, that's a huge win. And the, the biggest example of the, the political risks of being a climate denier are the latest elections. Look who we elected, a guy who talked about climate change in every speech he gave. We elected Joe Biden, who's going to return to the Paris Agreement on day one, who has assembled the most impressive climate panel of cabinet members you can possibly imagine. These people are so smart and so good. Um, and he's got actual concrete plans to help decarbonize our country, generating jobs along the way instead of losing them. So clearly the, the loser was the guy who said climate change is, is not a thing. Thus, it has been a risky stance. In her book, Merchants of Doubt, Naomi Oreskes writes about 
the public affairs strategies of the pesticide industry, the tobacco industry, the fire retardant industry, who all propped up so-called experts and funded research uh, designed to introduce doubt uh, about just how conclusive the evidence is that smoking causes cancer or that fire retardants cause cancer or that uh, pesticides cause cancer. And, you know, the folks they hired are the same folks behind, you know, creating doubt around whether or not climate change is man-made. Um, one of them passed away last year, Frederick Singer. He was the president of the Academy of Science, um, but he was a physicist. He wasn't a climate scientist. And he was the same guy who the, who the, the tobacco industry paid to say, yeah, um, smoking doesn't cause cancer. So we're in this environment where, you know, all it takes 3%, 1%, half a percent of a well-placed expert from within a tribe to say, you know what, this is inconclusive. And then we as citizens say, well, you know, we're not scientists. We don't know. This guy feels the way he feels about abortion and gun rights and immigration the same way we feel. So he's obviously a rational person and he'll evaluate this issue the same way. We'll just follow him. And they strategically introduced doubt as a way of delaying regulatory action. So, you know, until it is entirely unsafe for people to take the position of climate denial, I fear that we'll still be in this never ending you know, uh, a cycle from a regulatory standpoint of, well, is it conclusive? Is it really time? Should we do anything about it yet? Yeah, I mean, but you you yourself made a great point when you talked about, you know, the cigarettes issue. The last chapter of this book is called Where to Find Hope. And it is, you know, climate change is, is generally a massively depressing development and terrifying for us, for our kids. But there is so much going on. Like during the four years when the Trump administration did nothing, everybody else just kept charging right ahead. In fact, 25 of the 50 states organized into a group called We Are Still In and said, we are going to stick with the Paris Agreement. We don't care what the federal government does. And the same thing with the corporations. That these days it's really risky for corporations not to clean up their, their climate act both because of the PR effect that their customers are going to see, but also internally, their own, their own employees. I mean, look at Amazon's unbelievable steps toward climate responsibility last year. You know, they're gonna buy 100,000 electric trucks. They're d d dedicating $10 billion to climate solutions. Um, all of this came about because of a rebellion among the workers, not from Jeff Bezos, not from external pressure, but from internal pressure. And then the third one is investor pressure. Now, no matter how altruistic or evil you are as a corporation, investors freaking care what you're doing. Tell your listeners who care to go to cdp.net. It's the Carbon Disclosure Project. This is an outfit that has collected these elaborate surveys from 10,000 publicly traded companies that asks, what are you doing about climate change and how vulnerable are you to climate change? And it's incredible what you find out. For example, here's a drug company saying, well, actually we're, we stand to gain 30% a year in revenue because people are gonna be sicker. I mean, they're, they're like pleased with this. Um, so anyway, so the bottom line is the world is changing. We're not going to be stuck at one level. Uh, the number of people who believe and who care are, are are increasing every year. Just look at the, you know, the the uh, the young people and their marches and their school strikes. I mean, all over the world, people are making enormous strides. Um, and finally, this is this is my favorite thing. When you mentioned the cigarette issue, this pattern of the public getting concerned over an environmental concern, the corporate interests that want to protect the status quo trying to muddy the science with hired experts. And then the third act is the public's opinion eventually winning. 
This has happened over and over and over. This happened with leaded gasoline. Standard Oil hired experts. Le leaded gasoline was causing people to have memory problems, motor function problems. Um, they got cancer. They were getting really sick, people who worked with the gasoline. <coughs> and Standard Oil said, oh, there's no real proof. And they trotted out experts to say so. But you know what? A few years later, unleaded gas, uh, unleaded gas came along and leaded gas is banned. Um, same thing with, remember the chlor, chlor, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, the uh, CFCs, sorry, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, that were in all our aerosol cans. They were destroying the ozone layer, an important layer of the atmosphere that protects us all from dying of skin cancer. Well, there was these scientists said, hey, this is bad. We are destroying the ozone layer. Guess what? The chemical companies trotted out experts that said the science is bad, don't believe them. Well, what happened? Truth eventually won. So yes, that's we're in act two right now. We're in the stage where they're hiring experts to muddy the science, but there's absolutely no question that they're losing and will lose. appreciate the uh, attempted segue over to hope. Thank you for that. <laughs> I, I, I did breathe a sigh of relief when you said it, but you do have a chapter in the book about preparing for societal breakdown. So I guess let's wrap it up on that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So one effect of really traumatic uh, weather events like Hurricane Katrina, for example, or the wildfires this year in California is that society breaks down. I mean, during Katrina, 79% of the police officers on the force did not even show up for duty. They just scattered like the winds. They're like, hell no, I'm out of here. And in fact, there was footage of looters smashing the windows of car dealerships and driving away cars. And among them were policemen, off-duty police. So if society breaks down during extreme events, what can we do? So this was, this was the chapter that anticipates that moment when your community breaks down in a hurricane, a wildfire, a flood, when the government is nowhere to be found or when government breaks down. Because let's, let's face it, why are we law-abiding citizens? It's not because there's a policeman right there waiting to arrest us if we run a red light or walk out of a restaurant without paying. It's because we have this communal belief in a system that is, you know, I, do, you, do you still stop at a stop sign at 3 a.m. on a deserted rural area? Well, probably just because you have this belief that that's how society runs. But when all hell is breaking loose, those kinds of things go away. And, you know, during any of these major hurricanes or wildfires, you can't count on that. So there's a chapter on, you know, what to do if you're caught in a mass uprising outside. Um, there's I had a long conversation with my editor at Simon & Schuster about whether we talk about guns. Um, how you feel about guns is very different according to where you live and how you were raised. People have very strong beliefs either way. Um, so I talked to a survivalist expert. This guy was fantastic. He's a gun owner, but he said, you know, statistically, guns really aren't the best way to protect yourself from home invaders. What I recommend is that you get a tactical flashlight. These are these things that the military and law enforcement use. They're flashlights that are so bright, they disorient you. I mean, you can't look in that direction, let alone move in that direction. So there are many stories on Reddit of people who bought one of these things. And when some home intruder was approaching their house, they shine the light in the guy's face. You know, somebody who's high or drunk or out to, to rob the house and say, get the beep away from me. And they do. They'll find another house to rob. They don't want to mess with you. So there are, there are solutions. And again, the key is to, to light your house. You know, for home, at Home Depot for 10 bucks, you can get a solar powered yard light that shines light on your house after dark. And when the crap hits the fan, all you care is that the, that the home invaders or whatever you're worried about goes to some other house and not yours. So you can do that by making there be no place to hide with the lights. Um, if you are listening and you'd like to get the podcast of this interview, go to ericschwartzman.com forward slash earned media, and we will have a link to a tactical flashlight that you can buy 
to deter home invaders. Um, join us next week at the same time for a conversation with Clayton Johnson, the chief marketing officer at the Hoth. And we're going to talk about online communications and where they're headed in 2021. David, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thanks, man. And thanks for taking the time to, to prepare for this interview. That was really superbly done. Thank you.